Uh, can I welcome members, invite guests and the public, both here and those watching on the webcast, back to today's meeting of the Health Committee. Our main topic of discussion is the Health Inequality Strategy, the draft implementation plans and indicators, and we encourage anyone taking part in the discussion on social media to use the hashtag uh, Assembly Health. First, we have a few short items of formal business to go through before we get to our witnesses. Uh, can I have the apologies, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. We've received apologies for absence from Assembly Member Hall, for whom Assembly Member Arthur will be substituting, and apologies for absence from Assembly Member McCartney. Uh, thank you. Uh, can I ask the members to note the lists of uh, offices set up in item number two of the agenda? We we'll will also, also ask the members if have any other interest to, to declare. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, can we note the membership and chairing arrangement of the Health Committee as listed in the agenda? Great. Uh, can we note the terms of reference of the Health Committee as stated in the agenda? Uh, can we note these committees uh, standing, um, standing delegations? Great. Can we note the minutes of the, for, of the meeting from the 28th of February and the 14th of March 2018? Yeah, noted. Um, and can we note the completed announcements and actions for the previous meetings, the response for the Mayor to the work of the Health and uh, Work and Health Report attached in the appendix to? Noted. Uh, thank you. And uh, can we note the recent action taken by me as Chair under delegate authority, namely to agree, the, uh, agree in consultation with the Deputy Chair the following priority of topics 2018-19, the terms of reference of this committee, any further output relating to the committee's investigation of 2017-18 and arrangements for any site visits, informal meetings or engagements activities such as the committee's last formal meeting. Okay. Well, that brings us to the main topic, the discussion of the draft implementation plan and indicators for the health and quality strategy. Um, can I now ask welcome our two guests, uh, Professor Evan Doyle, the health advisor to the mayor and uh, London Regional Director for Public Health England. Thank you, Professor Doyle, for coming. And also Dr. Tom Kofi, Senior Advisor to the Mayor on the Health Policy. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go through the uh, draft of health and quality strategy. Um, and so we have some questions for you. And I'll uh, start the questions off. We had the draft inequality strategy published some months ago and we now have the implementation plan which came to us about three weeks ago, I think it was. Why has it taken us so long to reach from the draft to the implementation stage? What, what made us take so much, why did it take us so long to do that? What happened in between the draft and the implementation plan, in other words? Yes, Chair, do you want me to answer that first? Um, so, well, first of all, my apologies. I mean, it isn't our intention to uh, delay your scrutiny on this, but I think what has happened between the end of the consultation, um, and I think you wrote to us and wanted to see this in January, we just didn't think there was enough ambition in the response by January. We hadn't, first of all, gone through everything that people had said, but also, um, I felt personally we could do more and I think what we have now is um, a, a set of ambitions that are so full they've given us time to go through all the other strategies and ensure that health is in there and also see what offers we can bring forward as part of our strategy. Yeah. So a, a good bit of this was actually trying to enrich the implementation plan itself so that it looked real and it also had traction across the GLA. Mm -hmm. um, and the second reason is that we're very conscious of the need to play in other partners, particularly the NHS, and I think as the 70th anniversary comes forward, there's a much sharper interest in inequalities mm -hmm. among our partners, so we wanted to make sure that we could capture some of that in some of the pledges. Great, thank you. And, and, and yeah. um, it's all about getting it right. Yeah. And uh, and I think yeah we've had meetings with yourselves and and I think you know have given us a lot of challenge and um, and I think what you'll find for for Sadiq's uh, approach to this is you know what can I do and what can I do regarding pure health initiatives 
But probably more importantly for him, how can I make there is health in all my strategies? And all the other ones have been coming out, as you're aware, over the last kind of few months. And how can we make sure the environment, transport, planning, you know, have all got health embedded in them? So that process as we needed to make sure was reflected in our implementation plan. Because the question you will ask us rightly, well, how will we do this? And we want to do it by what we do in health, in all wider strategies, but also NHS and wider partners, voluntary sector and local authority. So it's about getting it right and timing it amongst other partners as well. Thank you. Um, this is a two-year plan and it contains 117 actions to be undertaken by the Mayor. Are all of this expected to be delivered or underway by 2020? Um, Chair, some of them are, and some of them are part of, uh, you know, some of the targets go beyond 2022 or 2020. Um, what I would absolutely want to see is progress in all of them by the end of this mayoral term. But some of them have got a deadline by 2020, and the uh, intention is that we do deliver that. Okay. There are some areas where there are no targets. And uh, how do you intend to monitor your partners? in making progress on those objectives, if there are no monitoring targets for some areas? In a number of ways. Um, we, since, uh, the, really, since the, this setup, since the Health and Social Care Act has been enacted, there has been a, an ambition by London to work in partnership much more maturely, uh, because we have to. It's a, quite a fragmented system. So we're building on that partnership to really hold the partnership itself to account uh, for how it enables <coughs> this to happen. Uh, we're not starting from scratch. We had it previously had 10 ambitions to be the healthiest global city. A lot of those have translated forward. So we watch that annually and the indicators in here capture some of that. So I think the indicators will be important um, and they're regularly shared with partners. But we have a, a governance structure in London now, Chair, that actually does bring forward um, joint ambitions. And while understanding that we cannot command, say, local government or the NHS to do things, nevertheless, um, our, depending on the strength of the partnership and the reality of the ask, we're, we are very confident that some of these joint actions will deliver. And they're delivered through a governance structure that goes right back to the Mayor, through the London Health Board. My question was, if you aren't, don't have any monitoring, if you aren't monitoring them, right, if you have no measurements of them, how do you know you're working towards that goal? Absolutely. I, well, I mean, we can all be saying we less quiet to do something about 2.30, 2.40, right? Yeah. Uh, but how do I know that I'm making that journey if we aren't monitoring those things? There are a number of, beyond the five key performance indicators for the Mayor, there are a number of other ambitions implicit in here which are measurable. And I think one of our challenges going forward will be to devise the right measures for those um, system mm. deliverables. This is a challenge nationally, but we're up for this. So that we actually bring that both to the planning board, which is the officer board, but also annually to the um, to the London Health Board, and there will be an annual event where we actually account for how we're doing. Great. I know one, one of my colleagues is going to go in a bit more detail into the indicators. Yes. Thank um, you. Andrew? Thank you. You've, you've published key performance indicators which you're only unable to measure performance against. Well, so, I mean, some of these are uh, performance indicators that the mayor himself will account for. So he's willing to put his name against, you know, 10% of early years settings signed up by 2020. We know what the number is. We'll be able to account for whether that has happened or not. But um, you're, you're right in one sense, um, uh, um, uh, Mr. Both. The um, and all of these depend on cooperation to some degree. They're not uniquely within any one person's gift. Uh, the, one, the five that have been uh, indicated to the mayor are ones where he really has got some considerable leverage. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, those five, I think we can actually say that we will expect them to deliver. Um, but all of them, you know, will depend on cooperation, say, from local government, particularly local government, uh, or from schools, but there are areas where we have strong relationships and sometimes funding relationships as well. And, and, and we, we, we do try to kind of uh, 
First of all, some of the indicators that we've chosen for, let's say, population health, you, you want to make sure you're choosing something which we know that it's already been collected. We know it's got an indicator which, uh, say, indicates um, an area of health inequality. And then the target for the work stream, and I'm looking at the one which uh, Yvonne mentioned regarding, say, school readiness mm -hmm. and uh, children taking part in the new early year scheme. So we think, what is in the mayor's gift? We think that developing an early year scheme, whereby we get healthier early year schemes, 13,000 places in London which offer early years, can we get 10% of them by 2020 adopting this early years programme? Now, the programme has been deliberately de designed to uh, improve you know, school readiness, which we've got a marker for. We know there is an inequality between school readiness, between those children on free school meals and those are not on free school meals. Quite a good indicator of inequality. We have then therefore deliberately made sure that the early years programme is targeted in those, pro in those boroughs where there's more poverty. So we are trying to do a direct link between our ambition, our plan, our target, and an indicator which will assess health inequality. So we do try and bring those four together, and I would hope that's quite a good example. So how will you monitor progress on those mayoral actions that are not covered by uh, key ambitions? So, so, so um, can, you, can you give me and an example? Uh, I mean, um, we've got... Uh, actually, I'm struggling. Um, well, 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 for, 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 I, I think looking at London is aiming to meet the national target of 10% reduction number of suicide by 2021. Yeah. How are you going to monitor that? So, um, yeah. so, um, so, so there is a so the, the level of suicide, which is. Uh, uh, thankfully, quite low, you know, in London. Um, you know, the the numbers are, um, c you know, uh, c captured very carefully through London. So the suicide rate in London, you know, there is national data for that, so we can measure that. Now, I think the question you're asking is, what interventions are we doing, you know, which will have an impact on that? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, suicide and many health behaviours have a numerous complex... Um, uh, causes and so all we know is that, that the work we're doing is evidence-based and it will contribute we would hope to the uh, creation of you know, robust children and we know the more robust the child is the less likely to commit suicide to lobby for improved health services mental health services for Londoners we know that has an impact on suicide to make sure we have better housing reduce rough sleeping we know that has an impact on suicide. Can I say to you, all those will reduce four suicide a year? No, I can't. But do I think we've chosen initiatives which we know will reduce suicide? Yes, we have. Will we monitor the suicide rate in London? Yes, we will. And the estimation will be that the multitude of interventions that we do and other partners do, believe me, in the health services, yeah, Dr. Hurt knows, we have a, a very careful focus on what we can do to prevent suicide. So you're right, it, if the suicide rate does go down by 10%, it will be a false claim of me to say that was due to what the Mayor did. But we would hope that what we're doing is evidence-based and will contribute to things which we know do reduce a person's likelihood to commit suicide. First of all, let me, uh, we've had a health and quality strategy before, in the last majority of the last 10 years. Has anyone done any work to see what the impact of that was at all? Well, Did it make any difference at all? Were there any interventions that the mayor made which you can show to me that if he hadn't done those interventions, this would have been the this, this would have been the result? But because he did those things, that's the result. Yeah, I mean, Did anyone have, do that we, analysis? Have, we have evaluated some of the, um, yeah. without going into a previous political regime, I don't think there's anything like this in, okay. that I've seen in previous regimes. Um, it just didn't imbue in the same way, partly because um, the, the health function has been developing and maturing. So I think the timing is right to get it as, as rich as it is now. So we're not really comparing like with like. But yes, we did evaluate the Healthy Schools programme, which the previous mayor had funded. 
and uh, and we've evaluated some of the sports work. Um, and yes, I mean, if I can tell you, because national government didn't fund it, if that hadn't been funded by the mayor, we would not have 2,000 schools joined up now and ready to go, and you know, a good proportion of those uh, getting awards, 1,400 of them, I think. So, you know, that's something that w has made a measurable difference to the infrastructure of London and the resilience of those children. And we have a formal evaluation on that. Can but I just interrupt? The yeah. previous mayor, for example, had a, a, an ambition on, on obesity, for example. Yeah. Um, I mean, isn't it worth us using whatever the previous mayor had, measuring that? Did it work? Did it not work? What should we keep? What should we change? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so has any kind of work been done of that res in that yeah. respect? So, um, bearing in mind that um, it's obesity, um, first of all, there wasn't a huge awareness that there was a very unique London problem until about 2013. I didn't hear many people talking about child obesity or doing much about it in a coordinated way. And we did work with the previous mayor. It, it took some time to persuade everybody first, and that, that was that really took about 15, 18 months. We then had commitment, political commitment, not just from the mayor, but actually from this committee and from others, that we did need to be seen to do things. And we had an obesity and still have an obesity plan as part of the London Commission. And we have been measuring quarterly what's been going on with child obesity. And there is a change in the younger age groups, which is where we had made a very big effort to curtail what is going on here. So that monitoring of those techniques has happened across the board? or, or Yes, it's or happened, well, it's happened through Public Health England because we, that is one of our guardianship roles, but we're very much in tune with uh, ensuring particularly that local government where a lot of the wider environmental interventions happen and where the um, boroughs, uh, three quarters of them, have obesity plans through their health and wellbeing boards. Uh, so, yes. And, and I was going to uh, take Mr. Boss' point whereby uh, it's quite a sensible one whereby you don't chuck out the baby with the bathwater when you get a new administration. And so, um, uh, uh, Mayor Johnson uh, commissioned the London Health Commission, and there was a Healthy London Partnership which was formed out of that, and there's 10 work streams. That system is still running because we looked at it and we felt that. What the Mayor had started previously was a good analysis of London's health and health issues and had started you know, quite a reasonable plan which had tried to address those areas. And when we spoke to the Mayor um, and described what the Health of London Partnership was doing, we felt actually it, it, it started well and in fact we are trying to use it wherever possible to continue the work so that we don't have a stop start, that we learn from what we've done and we also uh, use the people who have been engaged for a number of years to say can you please carry on because what you're doing isn't party political, it's about the health of Londoners. So I, I actually think we have done what you suggested, we have looked at what's happened before and have mostly carried it on. Yes, um, one of the things that's uh, in, I'd, I'd like a comment on is uh, is on your population level indicators. Mm -hmm. um, it, it it looks quite a binary. If, if it gets slightly better, then it's a success. If it if it gets slightly worse, uh, then it's a failure. Uh, for example, the current gap of uh, a healthy life expectancy in males from the richest to the poorest, or the uh, if, if 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 we're using those terms, is fifteen point two years. Um, if we made that 15 years, would that be a massive success or would that, that, that really be the sort of success that we're actually looking for? Yes, and I mean, I, I absolutely concur with this question because um, we thought very hard about what was the right overall way to express um, progress on inequalities. And while the NHS is looking a lot at mortality, and actually if you look at mortality for London, it looks like we have made great progress because the, it is the region of the whole of England which has made the best progress for male and female mortality in recent years. And we could just rest at that. But our view is that actually it's how people live their lives and the functionality and their well-being, but also how they use the services is very dependent on their healthy life expectancy. Now, a year extra of that isn't going to make a huge difference. It, you know, just going around handing it out like Christmas presents isn't what we're about. 
It is about seeing a trend improvement in how we can defer uh, particularly chronic illness and a lot of that is mental unwell, being mentally unwell. Um, pushing that back further and further into later years and at the moment for poor communities that unwellness starts really in your 50s and it's it is one of the issues that uh, I think we have to face as a society is we have been far too focused on how long people live without considering the quality of their life. But, but the implementation, you know, sorry, the, your, your measure yeah. is, is, is it success if it gets slightly better. Um, yeah, yes, I mean, we'll be, we'll be celebrating if we see a, a cur we always do, if we see a curtailing of a trend, but that isn't the point, it isn't the end in itself, wouldn't, nor is it from wouldn't beasting. A, wouldn't a kind of numerical target be something worth considering in that respect, so, a non, a rather non, than saying... A non-numerical. A, a numerical target. A numerical target. target. Well, I mean... Because rather well, than saying it's got to improve a little... Yes. It's got to improve, which and, and you're not quantifying the level of improvement. Why do you say it's currently 15 years, but we want to make that 5 or 10? Or yes, I mean, I would, what we would like to see is that the um, gap between those who have the best of that, which is, you know, they're nearly 70, uh, that reduces between the best and the worst. That is the inequalities measure. And yeah, I would love to see that. So we have 20 years of difference in disability uh, in London. And that gap has to narrow, and it's 20 years. Mm. So if we can get there, that would be terrific. That but would in terms be of the monitoring, successful. we're still just monitoring whether or not it's improving. We are just monitoring improving. whether it's improving, but I absolutely take your point about the narrative around this. It isn't simply about <coughs> a, a, an improving trend for a year or a half a year. That won't actually improve anyone's life. Okay. Um, what about the, 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 the data itself? Are you going to ensure that the delivery plan is, or the monitoring of the delivery plan, is uh, transparent and open? Yes, and uh, this was something we are very ambitious about, and we learned it in New York and in cities that do make progress, is they share um, health information in ways that uh, people value. Um, so I would love to see this information on billboards, uh, on Twitter, everywhere so that our annual event is a big deal for London and Londoners celebrate or hold us to account for why things are or are not improving. It is their health that belongs to them. We are nowhere near that in terms of the ownership of how this actually plays out and that I think is one of the important elements of the delivery itself. So, so will you commit to publishing the annual monitoring reports on the GLA website? Absolutely. And not only that, but the, the data, if people want it, will be in the data store. So they can actually go to that as well and use the data and see how, where their area, where their condition has improved. Thank you. Uh, so you, you talked about mortality, Professor Dwan. Is there any measure of avoidable uh, mortality? So this is, uh, yes. And, and if there are, are we measuring them? Yes, and I think this is the area that the NHS will look at uh, a great deal because a good deal of avoidable mortality it comes through in the kind of what happens to people when they are in the healthcare system, how early they're diagnosed is an absolutely critical one, particularly for cancer. I mean, I, I know you know this, Dr. Sohota, but I don't think it's widely appreciated um, as an inequalities measure that the reason that we have problems, particularly with poor, whiter communities, is that they're not appearing early enough with the conditions that lead to serious outcomes for them, and also their lifestyles are very poor. So early diagnosis is one way of mitigating what may have happened to them earlier in life in terms of their risk. The quality of care is very important, but also this whole business of um, healthy life expectancy, how can you actually prevent <coughs> The biggest issue we're going to face is diabetes, actually. Diabetes and mental ill health are the two, I think, that are going to cause us a great deal of avoidable <coughs> mortality, but particularly diabetes. <coughs> and so and looking at the targets here, yeah, so you look at targets six, seven, and eight, they specifically focus on mortality. So one and two is about healthy life expectancy, yeah. how healthy you are when you're alive, and how many healthy years do you have? 
but about you know people dying related to uh, illnesses which we think are preventable. And as you'll see there, it's excess mortality amongst people with serious mental illness, which we know already is much much higher. Um, and also suicide, which we feel is preventable. Again, that's one of our indicators. And the last one is um, on number eight, is regarding people being exposed to poor air quality and the excess mortality attached to that. So I think we are doing what you're asking us to do, which is to say, well, where does the excess mortality lie? Is that preventable? And are we doing things in our plan which will address that? And I think it's yes to all three questions. And just before we go to leave targets around, the, the theory about targets is that you've got to be really ambitious to push targets. If you want to push any system, you have to really aim at something which is unachievable, and that pushes the system. And because it, you get dilution on the way, things aren't achieved. Do you think we have been ambitious in our targets here? Um, yes. Uh, I do, because I think we have to deliver some of this. Um, and if we are constantly chasing a rainbow, I mean, the, the biggest ambition we have is to be the healthiest global city. And many people have said that's, that's terrific, but it's a rainbow. You never know, you never get there. I think we, w we would if we put our mind to it, but it's a big ambition. Now, 10% of the early years signed up by 2020 is, a, is something that gives people confidence that this team can do it. They actually do what they say they'll do. So I think we need a combination of you know, things that people can see and feel and things that people aspire to. And I, I think we've got both, but I'm you know, very interested in uh, your views about this, about you know, how ambitious we could be. I think perhaps some of the ones that look a little bit less ambitious are where you're pushing out to 2041 or 2028. And I would say on those, I'd like to be seeing progress a lot earlier than that. And we need to account for that progress. And, and, and if I can uh, talk about ambition and, and give you an example, mm. where I think that we, that we are showing, and the Mayor's showing a level of ambition. So for childhood obesity, and um, if we look at our, uh, target number five, so you know, what we, we are surprised at is that London you know, has got quite healthy children. On the national surveys, we smoke less, actually smoke less than the rest of the country, drink alcohol less than mm. the rest of the country, but they're heavier than the rest of the country. And therefore, that's, that, that needs to be a clear target for us because not only as a city are we worse than the rest of the country, but there's a massive health inequality divide. The poorer children are the most obese. And then, then, then what do we do about it? And so one of the things we're, we're consulting on, as you're aware, quite recently, is not just about making sure that we can restrict new obesogenic food outlets near schools, but we've taken a, a very ambitious approach to how we use the TfL advertising slots and uh, advertising high fat, salt and sugar you know, advertising. You know, we could have been much more timid there, but I think the Mayor showed an enormous level of ambition and was applauded, I would say, throughout the country to say, if I'm going to do something about childhood obesity, I've got to be brave and ambitious. And I think has done probably what most commentators would have said is the most ambitious approach to remove it from all our uh, advertising platforms on TfL. Um, thank you, Chair. I've got a couple of questions on funding. So the draft implementation plan includes a number of commitments to fund particular projects and programs. And we've got uh, one example in our briefing paper about the London Family Fund. Yes. But also there's little information available in the plan or strategy on how much funding will be allocated to these projects uh, over the remainder of, the, of this mayoral term. So in light of this, can I ask you how much funding is being allocated to the mayoral actions outlined in the strategy? And also, will you undertake to provide a full breakdown of the funding that will be made available each year to carry out the activities uh, set out in the implementation plan? Um, yes, uh, Mr. Desai, we can. Um, uh, I've been going through, because quite a lot of the um, the commitments here are involved with other strategies and I've been going through totting up the, the funds and how they're going to um, <coughs> improve health. So I think we have got numbers around some of these funds and there are a lot of them. There's also the work of the health team itself which is funded by the Mayor and the schools programmes. So there is a budget for, uh, for the work that is done here. Um, there's also contri contributions uh, from all of us to the Healthy London Partnership, which are, uh, you know, cash. 
Um, but I think quite a lot of what will happen here also will be leverage. So for instance, on the child obesity work, we have leveraged already um, several million pounds over 10 years from a charity which is working with us on the task force. Uh, so I would like to see more um, explanations as to how we can leverage more funding in. We're looking at that through um, uh, processes like social impact funding to see can we get more funding in. So we have got figures from the GLA. We can produce those and we can provide them. We have got what our team is funded to do. We have got funding from the Healthy London Partnership and the Prevention Board. We have got an, a, an estimation of the benefit in kind that partners are bringing in terms of time and people, and there's a much bigger group of people working on this than are sitting here. Uh, but beyond that, I think we need to think really creatively about how we can spot some of the funding that may become available where we have got good ideas, good business cases, and we tap into that so that we augment what's there. And if, and if I could say, uh, give you some uh, specific examples as well. I was looking for. Mm -hmm. So, um, so uh, one of our kind of showcase commitments is air quality. There is a, a Mayor's Air Quality Fund of about £20 million, which is being used to address some of the air quality issues in London. As I've said very clearly before, air, air quality in London it, you know, is poor and it's worse than the poorest areas. As we address and improve air quality, so that benefits the lungs of the poorest in London. The Young Londoners Fund, I think, which is uh, £45 million to spread over the next few years, again, much of that will be used to address young, young Londoners and it will improve both their mental health, their social well-being, yeah, and yeah, that will have a direct impact on what we're trying to address here. The devolution agreement, we described last time, has given us an opportunity to have a greater say in how the NHS spends its enormous amount of uh, uh, funds. And one of the areas which we're working on at the moment, the transformation funds the NHS has, has been devolved to London. We're working on the Strategic Partnership Board to see how can we, for the first time at the same table as the NHS as well, us, the local authorities and NHS, deciding how that money is spent. We will be advocating very clearly that some of that money is spent on some of the ambitions in the health and equality strategy. We ask our partners to go with us. Simon Stevens, the chief exec, recently has said, you know, that one of the priorities for the next 10 years will be addressing health inequalities. He's praised already the work we're doing in London. We will be going to the NHS to make sure very clearly they make hard cash commitments to the pledges they've made to address this. So there are a number of areas, the money the mayor's doing in health and all policies, the money the mayor's doing in the GLA, and the money we will extract from our partners to deliver this strategy. Thank you for giving us those examples. So the Young Londoners Fund you mentioned, I think that's over three years. So maybe not now, but if you could give us, a, as I said in my original question, full breakdown of the various funding streams that will be made available each year yeah. um, uh, to carry out the activities that have been mentioned in the plan. Yeah. And also, again, thank you for giving us examples, but if you can give the committees more details of the yeah, various definitely. funding. In terms of the very we'll tell them you're asking for it. So when we go to ask for it, we'll say that you know the GLA Health Committee are behind us on this. And um, finally, can I just ask you? The mayor talked about uh, his commitment to quote support unquote rather than fund activities. So what does it mean by that? What types of support will be offered? For, for, for which uh, actions? If we have an example, that we could really perhaps. Uh, so in any of them, the mayor will support. Well, he's talked about. Like a child health digital hub, for instance. Yes. And it's talking of supporting it. So what exactly do you mean by support? What, what form will this support take? Well, some of that is actually advice and support and professional advice into these programmes so that we get the right type of offer to the population. Um, but some of it is use, using the mayor's voice to actually augment and hold to account. Um, so where the mayor isn't directly delivering the service. The Mayor's voice very often carries further. And through the London Health Board, which we've just had a meeting on yesterday, you know, members come along and describe how, what, what they're doing and the Mayor will prompt and has been very forceful on prompting on some of the programmes where we feel we could make more progress. 
Um, on children, we think this is a good programme, but there are programmes where perhaps we're not making as much progress and, and the Mayor's voice has been very prescient mm -hmm. on holding to account by quarter so that when people come back they have something to say about progress. Uh, I just want to pick up this thing about funding and uh, the collaboration between the 32 boroughs, right, the health board and the prevention board. There's something which are best, I mean, as you know, the public health budget sits with the local authorities. There's something which are best done on a London-wide basis. Are the boroughs cooperating with the health board in bringing money together, looking at pan-London uh, initiatives? Is that, sort of, is that sort of collaboration taking place? Yes, um, it, it is, uh, Chair. Um, obviously, there are local accountabilities for the way that money is spent, and the health and wellbeing boards were very close to in terms of what their strategic intent is. But saying that, there are pan London programmes on a number, particularly on areas like mental health, which is a very good example. And I'm sorry I didn't give you this example, but Thrive London has a lot of joint funding committed to it. Mm -hmm. And one of its specifics is good, um, good Thinking, which is the big London digital programme. And there are other combined London digital programmes for other service, direct service delivery, where the boroughs cooperate. Uh, they cooperate on service delivery. They also cooperate with me and with Tom on particular programmes, like they all have suicide plans. They're required to, but we know what is going on in each borough. They are very active on obesity. They all have obesity programmes and people who they've committed to work with. And they advocate with their members to look at things like the Healthy High Street. Um, they have come forward with offers to us, which is very exciting, on one of the ambitions in here to create cleaner and less toxic zones around schools. So we have a number of boroughs who've come forward wanting to try that out. And we have 27 of 33 boroughs who have come forward with um, offers on the childcare, the early years. They want to cooperate with us on that and encourage registration. So I'm very confident that we have ways into all our boroughs, actually. And we have a new health lead in, um, in, in Councillor Poddyfoot. Uh, we've had two previous health leads. Um, it's been very good working with them. So yeah, you know, I, I think I think we can get there. The and, and the system that that we're going to kind of use as well is the health and wellbeing boards. And the, uh, the the each local authority has a health and wellbeing board. Myself and Yvonne went to meet all the health and wellbeing chairs a few months ago during the process of developing the uh, the his. And what they've come up to, to us and say, yeah, that we have an annual health and wellbeing board plan. Yeah, we, we want to incorporate what you're doing in your in your his and in your in your implementation plan. So we'll be going back to them in the future to say, yeah, once you know, we've gone through to due process to say these are our priorities, these are our initiatives, how can we work together? And when I when I've spoken to the health leaders and the council leaders, They've said that, that they would like us to work with them to develop easy to implement plans rather than just saying, oh, focus on child obesity. What is it that we can do? What works well? What's been done elsewhere? And can we just, you know, use other implementation plans? Because we recognise that the majority of the spend and influence on people's health in Londoners is from the local authority and the health service education service. So that's what good influence. So the local authority are keen and willing partners. They have now got a structure of health and wellbeing boards. We will use that structure to try to implement that which is within uh, our health and equality strategy. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mr. Robert? You have an overall target of uh, reaching 10% uh, of uh, childcare settings by uh, 2020, or 10% uh, for the uh, uh, programme across London. Won't that mean, because you're setting this London wide, that the likelihood is that you're actually going to increase the gap in as much as areas, for example, like Richmond, parents and children and, uh, and the various institutions are much more more likely to be keener on taking up your programme than in more deprived boroughs. Yeah, um, so therefore, the way we've tried to do that, and, I, and, I, and I, because it's important to make sure that we're not doing a health improvement plan, but a health inequalities plan. And uh, so when we've looked at the boroughs who are taking up the offer, we've made sure we've targeted at the boroughs with the most uh, poverty, and therefore to address the areas of health inequality. Um, uh, and so therefore the, the boroughs so far have signed up 
on more boroughs where there's uh, a, a more deprivation. As it happens, you know, you, uh, count, uh, Mr. Boff was talking about ambition. So our ambition of 10%, because we thought, you know, looking at previous pr you know, projects, you know, is 10%, you know, is that doable? 10% of the 13,000 in London, I think will exceed that. And, I, and also, and so therefore I've got a degree of confidence and ambition that will do more than 10% by 2020. And also, what I've seen so far, the boroughs taking up at the moment, we're deliberately targeting at those boroughs with most deprivation. Just so we don't do just what you suggest could happen, and I recognise that could, could have been the case. And you're confident, you're confident that even if you make it, if, if the achievement is 15% rather than the 10% that you have, uh, in, the, in the plan, that that 15% is much more likely to be achieved in the most deprived boroughs. So I'm very confident that will exceed 10% and I'm confident that we're designing and delivering the system to make sure it's targeted at the areas of greatest deprivation. I um, could I just add a supplement on the data here? Um, so this is where we use the data um, all the time to understand where the, re the, the need is. So our Public Health England data analysts work very closely with the team here to track where the greatest inequalities by various cuts are. So we know practically for any measure e what, where each borough would be on that. And we will direct and particularly encourage those boroughs. It's actually, to be fair, they don't need that much encouragement. But if we have an outlier, say, and, and the places perhaps where this happens and you don't expect it is in the outer rim of London, if we have an outlier, we would approach first and foremost the Director of Public Health there and the uh, officers and then the councillors to encourage them to engage if it's a particular issue that we feel they would benefit from. But so far, I think it has run it according to what the data would tell us is the greatest need. Well, I, I understand the point you're making, but even in those boroughs where there is the least um, uh, uh, obesity and, and the least problem, uh, there are pockets in those boroughs. Yes. And I'm a little disturbed to hear you say, Dr. Capley, that you will there that your proposal is to concentrate. Uh, uh, your resources and your efforts on those boroughs which have the worst problems, but that is to ignore the fact that even in those boroughs which apparently have the least problems, there are problem areas. I I'm confident every single borough in London will take up this project. Okay. And you are confident, and we're hearing it now for the first time, that uh, this 10% is a very low hurdle as far no, as you no, are concerned. I, no, because I, I've, I've listened to what the committee has said and I think you're, you, I think you're right about making sure you know, how we um, have ambition and because this is one where we're very tightly linked, what we're doing, population indicator, we've got a, a mode of delivery you know, which we know will improve school readiness. We know there's already a difference in school readiness between you know, uh, poor and more and, and wealthier parts of London. So, uh, you yeah, know, so I am, I suppose, you're rising to your challenge, and I, and I think we will, you know, exceed 10% in this area. All right. Um, and, uh, and again, in relation to that, you have a target of, um, uh, again, of um, reducing obesity uh, in uh, school children by 10%. Uh, is there a direct correlation between reducing obesity in school children and reducing obesity within a particular borough in general? Uh, the question being, I'm just trying to understand this question, um, that um, if we focus on particular schools in areas that, uh, where the borough seems to have a very high rate yes. of obesity, we would expect to see um, an improvement in the overall obesity rate in the borough. Is that a problem? What, 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 what I'm driving at is, whilst the children are in school, you may well be achieving that target. Yeah. The children leave school, um, if I'm going to come on to the advertisements on the buses and all the rest of it yeah. in, in a moment, they're then going to be liberated, if I can put it this way, uh, to drink uh, unhealthy drinks and eat unhealthy food. So why is there a correlation 
between, if there is a correlation between reducing obesity in schools and yet as soon as they leave school, I, I, I yeah. may be wrong, you, the children may not be tempted when they become adults, but um, is there any connection between them having a healthy lifestyle, if I can put it this way, in schools and continuing with that healthy lifestyle? Yes. So um, this is a very, this is absolutely the core of uh, some of our challenge in child obesity, is um, the school is a very worthy but poor second to the family. And the earlier, that, and this is why the, the kind of age four is so crucial, the earlier that the whole family can engage in um, healthier nutrition in general, starting with really pregnancy and breastfeeding, and moving on. Mm -hmm. That sets the child and the family up for life. Even if the family are overweight, which is um, sometimes mm -hmm. uh, you know, what happens throughout the life cycle, you know, the child has a much better chance if that family imbues, you know, the, and, and we know this, but actually the, that's where the evidence is strongest. When they go to school, um, there is some evidence uh, that what schools do make a difference to uh, child's, children's overall health. Certainly, if they improve their health, we know there's strong evidence that it improves their educational behaviour. Um, when they leave the school, uh, uh, before they even become adults, one of the issues we've now realised is the children coming out of school do go right away. We, uh, in very poor areas, very often, they'll go straight to the shop that has the least healthy nutrition. And part of that is actually because um, in some of these families there is no cooking facility or for cooking skills, so the child is, is actually feeding themselves through that route. So part of our work um, beyond the school is to try and influence that. Now, is there direct evidence that that is going to hit obesity? No, there isn't. It all comes together as part of a, a healthy package. But I don't know if I'm answering are, your question, I, I, but we're trying to I, get I, at all of it. I, 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 no, I, I, I'm sure not trying to, try, trying to work. Um, common sense... Tell, uh, tells them, you know, they're in school and there's a, there's a discipline, particularly if the parents aren't providing an unhealthy packed lunch <laughs> instead of whatever is uh, being given by the school. Let, let's suppose that these are children who are in receipt of uh, free meals. Um, that when they uh, leave school and they're not in the school environment, they will revert back mm. to the unhealthy things. So it may well work whilst the children are in school, mm -hmm. but when they're not in school, they will go back to, to whatever yes. it is. But you see, your target is for school children. Ought it not to be an overall target? And, and this comes back to what we will be trying to work with the obesity plan and the obesity task force about, which is, you're absolutely right, it, it cannot be dependent on one place. So the school is an important, but only part of a complicated set of actions that need to happen to reverse this. I mean, we've got ourselves into a bad place here. And I, I don't think we should overpromise because, you know, this has gone on for 30 years. Now, there's a lot of very hard work trying to reverse the, the most toxic elements of this. Our question as a city is, what, what can we do that is the right thing to do um, and that will inevitably probably help more the next generation of children if we get this right. But in the meantime, you know, if children are getting a, a sense of what good food is, what cooking is, how food grows, they get some sense of at least what they're putting in their mouth. And if we can influence the high street to be not, they're not, as we saw in Paris, you know, we did not see anything like the amount of fast food outfits in Paris and the child obesity rate there is 5% and it's you know at the same age it's 30% plus here so there is something that's different about some of the way these cities are doing their business and influencing their environment well I, I, I hope you're right and in fact I'm about to come on to that the one thing that uh, uh, Dr Copley sort of emphasized about the bravery of the mayor was in relation to the things he's got in the London plan, in, you know, in relationship to the advertising and to the food outlets. But in fact, if you look at the strategy, and I'm sure you're more familiar with it than I am, um, 
when we come to the section what the mayor will do, there's a whole list of things which he will do, some of which some things he will deliver, some he will use, some he will pilot, but in fact on those two particular things which you most praised, all the mayor is going to do is to consult. Yep. Now that doesn't seem like um, you know, absolute definitive bravery to me. I, I, I think, you know, the mayor needs to go through due process and when he's, he's consulting on things which I think are very ambitious. And, you know, you choose what you consult on and, and I, I believe that when we look at the differences that Evon said between us and Paris, or you look at the work that Amsterdam have done as a citywide approach yes. to childhood obesity, and you know, first of all, there is that kind of wide kind of family approach, and and and, and I think you are right regarding uh, the fact that you know that, that a child will spend forty hours a, day, a week in school, one hundred and twenty hours at home and outside. You know, so you've got to influence both, otherwise you, you, you're going to lose. And and equally, the uh, what we're consulting on, yeah, you know, I think are quite ambitious plans, and a consultation process will follow, you know, due course. Um, and the point I was trying to make to answer your, your colleague's question is how ambitious are we being? You know, you know, I, I feel you know, as a, a GP in London, having seen for years you know, various kind of uh, governments come and go and not really address some of the raw causes of childhood obesity, I'm quite impressed of the issues that our mayor has chosen to consult on. Well, I... I, I, I well, to draw a comparison, I say, between the phrase consult and... Uh, and, uh, and I, I accept that, yeah. Uh, particularly as where it refers to government, uh, who has described priorities to be led by external partners, who are principally, as far as I can see, the government here, um, there's a substantial exhortation. It says the government should, in fact, every single one, the NHS should, local authorities should, government should. In other words, uh, we in this building, by producing this strategy, which may or may not be endorsed by this committee, uh, in many ways, is, is expecting a different standard from our partners and from what we're doing ourselves. Is that fair? Um, no, I think um, the, the Mayor's got a role in, and I, I'm thinking about health, um, of doing what he can do within his powers, and also asking other partners to uh, also deliver what's in their powers as well. So what the implementation uh, plan you know, tries to lay out and divides it in those two ways about what will I do, what will I ask you know, my, my, my partners to do. And, um, and so uh, when, when, we t when we talk about who are the, other, the wider partners, we've talked about national government, local authorities, um, you know, the voluntary sector, the wider community, that's what we're asking. The should is a request to the partners to join us in what we can do to uh, improve health for Londoners. The mayor's got a key role to be an advocate for Londoners, and and I think this is him expressing that role. Yeah, the mayor, the mayor has influence. Yeah. Uh, uh, rather than, uh, you see, it's quite striking that the one healthy thing in the London plan, which the mayor says he will do, he's not going to consult on it. He's jolly well going to do it. Is to produce drinking fountains. Uh, and I've no doubt that's terribly worthy and so on. I'd be quite interested to know, uh, 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 perhaps, um, uh, you, you, you can both tell me, um, how significant is the provision of drinking fountains actually going to be in improving the sort of health outcomes of Londoners? Well, I mean, I can answer some of this in that the... Uh, um, the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition considers it very significant because sugar is sugary drinks are the biggest contributor to childhood obesity. Um, it's not that we might recognise it in the, it's children we know, but if you look at it in terms of inequalities, that's what they're putting in their mouths. Um, a lot, they're putting a lot of that into their mouths and it's going in through drinks, not actually, as you might imagine, through sugar. For, for, forgive, forgive me, but the yeah. one place where there is easy access to uh, drinking water, freely available from drinking fountains, is in fact in schools. What is being proposed in the London plan are the 
restoration, if you like, of the old public uh, drinking fountains, which presumably are not just for children, but for everybody. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm really seeking to know whether or not uh, that's a kind of window dressing, if you like, for making uh, London healthy, but in fact it's not going to make any measurable difference. Am well, I being a cynic? Um, not at all. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an a absolutely reasonable question, but we know because of the work we're doing with schools that all schools do not provide water as the default uh, drink. And in fact, quite a lot of them have um, uh, you know, vending machines and are producing sugary drinks during the day. And the children are, are taking sugary drinks into the school with them. So we have um, been working with schools to try and get, not, not every school, but uh, schools that will work with us as part of the Healthy Schools programme, to get more water fountains in the schools, to get free water into schools. But your question is whether it's significant or not. Um, it's in itself, uh, uh, Mr. Arbor, it's not. Um, it's only one action of many that have to happen in this very complicated programme around reducing why children are fat. Yeah. But I, it's not the only thing, could I just say, in terms of what the mayor will do, and I, I'm not yes. trying to defend the mayor politically, but th these five chapters are not unique to themselves. In yes. other parts of this strategy, there's a lot of commitment by the mayor to alter the environment, and the London plan is going to work through some of that as well. So I think there's more than just consultation in relation to child obesity in here. And, sorry, please, please. I, I, you, you said something that very interesting. I thought we had long ago in schools, not just in London but everywhere, got rid of vending machines on school premises which sold sugary drinks. I can see you shaking your head. No, ha, I don't, ha, has I don't there believe been work so. done on this? Well, part of our work on obesity is that we have somebody working with the water companies and the schools to try and improve the offer, the drink offer, to yes. just go for water. And we're happy to take that offline because it's not actually... It's a long time since I saw a Coca-Cola machine in the school uh, and it used to be universal. Yeah. And, and, and um, when we've looked at some of these kind of uh, key challenges, I think what we've realised is there's, you know, everyone loves a single, bu a silver bullet. We do this one thing and we'll address suicide, childhood obesity, air pollution. There's never a silver bullet. And when you look at citywide approaches to health, there's a hundred different things, all having incremental changes which make a difference. When we've looked at other cities, and Amsterdam regarding childhood obesity is one of them, by, they're saying you've got to get alliance of all your political leaders, you know, You've got alliance of all leaders in schools, education and health to work together with that single goal. And you might each do a hundred, one thing, but if a hundred of you are doing this one thing, that was, that was, that's what makes a difference. If you try to focus on a silver bullet, you might find that it's the wrong one. So, it, so the water fountains is only a bit of the jigsaw, but the jigsaw needs to be done completely. Of, co of course, but... I, I'm, I'm to, to, so, sorry, to pro, sorry to prolong this one, but it's an easy way for lay people, mm. and, and I'm only sitting here this morning by default, so I'm looking at uh, sort of challenging what seems to me to be odd. Uh, it, it's very hard for me to believe that at the same time as we're introducing drinking fountains into schools, and you've said that uh, not all schools have drinking fountains, those self-same schools are selling sugary drinks from machines. And I, ca I cannot believe that yeah, that's we'll happening. So I'm asking you for we'll, the evidence we'll, we'll that this happens. That. Um, but see that because yeah. so, so many schools that go on about healthy eating. I mean, every school I've ever visited goes on about healthy eating and, and healthy consumption. Yeah. You know, I don't drink water. We'll, we'll I think it's boring. You know, water is the most boring drink on earth and I can understand why people don't drink it. But, uh, you know, I just find it really implausible why um, I find it really implausible that these schools aren't, aren't taking this action. Well, we, we will find out more about that, but I know the, wor the work is going on with the schools about water, and some of that may also be uh, what children are taking to school with them, so trying to supplement that and encourage parents to accept water. And once the children get used to water, 
um, you know, all the evidence that we have is that they'll drink water preferentially, but once they get the taste for the sugary drinks, it's very difficult to change their habits. So part of it is working with parents. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jen. I've got a bit carried Thank away. I'm uh, sorry about that. <laughs> we, we want the people to see realize that we do have a wide spectrum of, of, of talent in the system of the Okay, uh, I want to focus our minds on to healthy minds. And one of the uh, initiatives is to get mental health first aid tra training uh, people into, in, into, into, into each borough. But what's the evidence that uh, there is that uh, raising awareness of mental health uh, through initiatives like the mental health the first aid training will reduce health inequalities? Do you, I mean, I'm happy to take yeah. this or... Okay. Can, so, yeah. so um, again, it's, you know, making sure how, how do we kind of target this work and how do we make sure that the, um, the work has an impact. So, so for mental health first aid, I mean, and, and I think you, you might be aware of this, it's something which we are um, adopting. There's, and there's different types of mental health awareness, mental health literacy, mental health first aid. And uh, Sadiq and the uh, deputy mayor did their own mental health first aid training. And uh, what we're trying to do is to uh, make sure that all schools have access to a mental health first aid uh, training. And uh, that you know, ha has t two impacts. First of all, it, uh, the first impact is how you, mental health first aid training is very much how you respond to a mental health first aid uh, issue, crisis. And so therefore... Uh, I, I understand. Uh, I understand uh, that raising awareness um, is important. I also understand that raising awareness might increase demand, right, for services. What I want to know is what's the evidence that this reduces health inequalities? So, therefore, it, so if we make sure it's in all our schools and uh, we target it to the schools again in the in the areas where there is the most deprivation, so you're making sure that those uh, you know those schools you know with the areas of most deprivation have the access to this, to this to this training so therefore that's about a targeted approach yeah um, but mental health first aid training in itself doesn't have a health inequality dimension mm -hmm. per se it's about mm -hmm. making sure that the schools perhaps in the most deprived area receive it is the where you will have the impact so um, I think I'd supplement that. I don't think we should overpromise that in itself mental health first aid would reduce inequalities. I think mm. it's very important that it's part of a um, almost a social movement to raise awareness and acceptance that there that you know young people do have serious mental health problems, and ninety percent of that mental health. Um, distress that they'll experience throughout their life is experienced before the age of twenty. It's there. Yeah. And 10% of our young people aged 5 to 16 are already exhibiting that. Now, what the, the question for us is, you know, how can we help address some of the distress they're experiencing? And that is more likely to be in places where the child has had adverse childhood experiences earlier. So there is an inequalities dimension to ensuring that the response is in the right place and in the right schools. <clears throat> Whether it is adequate in itself to to ensure the resilience, it's unlikely to be. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, only yesterday the, the, the Minister of Universities was saying that, that universities must take responsibility for mental health yes. amongst yeah, undergraduates perfect. and that yes. they are they're responsible for that. So I, 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 yes. I buy with that, right, and I, and I accept that. But I was just thinking of, of what this reason, these, uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, mental health first aiders do raise awareness about issues, which I think is good, Robert, but, but you accept that it doesn't have any impact on any health inequalities. All it does is make awareness of those facilities to people who have those problems. And, and so, and, and it, therefore, let's say two initiatives that the Mayor has focused on uh, recently, which, have, which is going to probably have a more direct impact regarding mental health and health inequalities, is the mental health input he's putting into rough sleepers and the mental health input he's putting in to assist the police when they're dealing pe with people who are often you know, in mental distress and getting involved in the criminal justice system. Because those two areas we know, you know, there is a significant health inequality dimension, <coughs> especially in the rough sleep sleepers, and, uh, and therefore that is going to have a much more direct impact on health inequality by addressing the mental health, which is in much higher than those groups, the mortality is much higher, both physical and due to suicide. Okay, given now that you accept that this is their good, how many do you want trained by 
say, say 2020, what's your target? How many you want to train by 2020? <laughs> Of these mental health, oh, mental, uh, I, I'm, mental I'm, health first aid trainers. I'm Given they're they're, they're, they're good, yeah, and we accept they're good. Yeah. Um, how do you want them in place? Right. So I know that, that, that. So the target we've got at the moment is for you know um, making sure that all, all secondary state schools have access to a mental health advisor and uh, uh, and a first aid trainer. So. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of, do we have a specific target in here about how many people in London will have undergone mental health first aid training? That's something we could look at to see. Well, I mean, if, you want want to, I mean, if you have one every single secondary school to have access to it, yeah. yes, you, know, you know the number of secondary yeah. schools in the capital. So that is our target. I'm, I'm reading it out from our... No, no, I understand. So I, I, I'm missing that. That's the reason why I picked it up, right, OK? Yeah. We know how many schools there are. How many do we want? And, and so that you can monitor, right, your progress so every in, in making state school. secondary school. Yes. So if, if maybe you can you can get back to us. Yeah, in London. Yeah. Or, or that that would be the number. That's Absolutely. our target. No, yeah. That's good. Yeah. No, but but there must be target for if you can be number, right? Of is it fifty? Is it hundred? Is it ten? Whatever it may be. If you let us know what the target is, okay. That chair, and there is a program, so we we'll know the number because there's a program through the Royal Society for Public Health of getting them through this training. So we'll be able to tell you the numbers. Okay. And still sticking to healthy minds, I, I know that access to mental health services is scarce and it's difficult for most Londoners, but it's more difficult for people like people who have LGBT community, the deaf, um, uh, the, the BME community have diff greater difficulty accessing mental health. Uh, and this is another inequality, right? What can we do to improve the access to mental health services for these groups? So, um, I, I, and uh, the health inequality strategy recognises that access to health care yeah, is a crucial determinant regarding health inequality. But also, and I think you understand this, what we've said yeah, very clearly is that uh, this is the role whereby we talk about uh, the mayor challenging and championing the NHS. And this is an area of distinct challenge. To say, how do we make sure that how can the mayor, in his role on the London Health Board, meetings we have with the NHS um, management team, to challenge them to say, how do we improve access to health services? Uh, one of the areas that we've had a particular focus on recently in the London Health Board has been accesses to uh, for children's mental health services. Uh, a green paper uh, from the government came out recently. You know, testing out the idea of how do we use schools to um, develop an improvement in children's mental health and children's mental health services, whereby the suggestion would be that every school has a link to uh, a CAMS worker, child and adolescent mental health service. Every school has its own mental health worker. Every school has a teacher, like a Senko, just on mental health. Sadiq, you know, uh, in his role as mayor and chair of the London Health Board, has been very clear that, and we've communicated this, that the ambition to have this done over five or six years is too slow. This needs to be done, you know, throughout the country. And uh, if, if London gets the chance, it would apply to be a trailblazer to make sure it got the, fund the funding to resource those initiatives, because he recognises that access to mental health services for all our population, but for children in this particular area, is less than he would like, less than Londoners would like, and we know that this is an opportunity to address it. So yes, access to, to health services is a health inequality issue, and this is an area where he's going to use his advocacy and his challenge to try and make a difference. Thank you. And the other ambition the Mayor has is to make London a zero suicide, suicide city. Is the mayor going to produce a strategy, city-wide strategy, to setting out the steps we need to take to become a zero suicide city? So, uh, um, the short answer to that is that there are a number of the, all the boroughs will have suicide plans. On, on for a city-wide plan, is yeah. I mean, the mayor has ambition to be London to be a zero city. Yeah. Are we going to have a London-wide plan? Yeah, the, the, yes, the short answer is yes, Chair. Um, through Thrive London, there is a city-wide uh, um, programme which is sponsored by the Mayor. 
and which is focused specifically on suicide. The only reason I mentioned the boroughs is it's important that it aligns with what they are trying to do. There are certain places, though, where it's really important London takes a citywide approach, for example, on the bridges, working with the City of London, um, on transport for London, uh, and you know, and reducing deaths on the underground. So definitely that will play into the Thrive Suicide Plan. When can we expect it by? Well, at the moment, Thrive London is working on it. I think, actually, there is a time here. I've, I've got this right, but forgive me if I haven't. I think it's November of this year, but we can check that out. If you let us know, right? There is a plan to so, that. Yeah. just for the record, there will be a citywide plan, and you will let us know the, the date. We can give by, you the But you think it's sometime, yeah, sometime November of this year? Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, thank you. Thank you. What, why? Have no performance indicators been established uh, regarding alcohol, drugs, or gambling? Because it's measurable. So, why am I? One reason is that um, those areas are uh, closely performance managed in other parts of the system, and the mayor's role here is really highlighting um, the, the citywide programmes that support other places. So for instance, um, we have uh, uh, strong we have uh, strong programmes on smoking uh, through the London, through the local authorities and through uh, Public Health England. Uh, we have a, a working with national government on an alcohol strategy which will play out through uh, the various partners. So they're not the specific responsibility of the mayor, but the mayor obviously has a part to play in all of that. Um, alcohol, drugs, the uh, local authorities all have as part of their um, public health mandate, they are expected to deliver drug related services and we at Public Health England monitor that on behalf of the city. So we can account for it, but it's not a mayoral, it's not a mayoral responsibility. So that we will be, you know, obviously we'll be feeding back in through this strategy as to how we're doing on that, and we monitor it. And, and so on page uh, twenty-three, I'm just looking, um, yeah, about you know, you know what, what can we do? And, and again, the mayor can do certain things or can can convene, and and I think this is uh, whereby you know his powers of convening are using the leadership which is based around City Hall and making sure that we can um, uh, develop a pan-London uh, you know, illegal tobacco and counterfeit alcohol team in, in this uh, kind of financial year by April 2019 to look at how we can actually um, uh, use uh, the work of the boroughs and the GLA. Because what we know is that um, uh, cigarette smoking now, the packet of cigarettes is about seven or eight pound. Um, higher, okay, t okay, so ten pound, and uh, uh, and so therefore, and counterfeit tobacco cigarettes are much cheaper. You can buy them in singles, mm -hmm. and children when they start to smoke, you know, rarely go and buy twenty cigarettes, and so uh, often the, the the time that a child will start to smoke is by having access to counterfeit tobacco. So what we are aware is that if you can stop a child starting to smoke by restricting the access to counterfeit tobacco, then you're making, it's, it's very, very few adults start smoking at age 25. Most people who start smoking start as a child. If you can stop them starting, you know, before they reach adulthood, they're probably never gonna smoke. So that's why the counterfeit tobacco approach, it stops children from starting to smoke. And that's what we are committed to do, to look at work on that by April 2019. So there are citywide programmes on, on all of these. There's a citywide tobacco control programme, there's a citywide alcohol programme, and the citywide approach to drug uh, uh, control. Um, but Tom is absolutely right, about 90, I mean, 24,000 kids start smoking every year, 24,500. And 90% of the smoking has occurred before they're age 20. It's just like mental health. So it is very important that we understand how we can curtail some of what is driving it. It is related to crime. It's different to the programs we have on stopping people smoking and you know giving them advice. This is actually a lot of it is criminal activity. So we're working through with MOPAC and the crime plan as to how, what is the best way of doing that. 
and part of the devolution agreement for London looked at this as well, as to how it could be funded, the relationship with HMRC, because there are big issues around tax evasion in this as well. But that's not our primary purpose, it's to improve children's health. I must say, I, I, find, it, I find it a bit difficult difficult to understand why it is that we, you know, we, we're using, we, we, we're measuring some things over which the mayor has no real control because we want to know we're becoming a healthier city and yet there's metrics that you could use for uh, 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 alcohol drug, and drugs and gambling. To the instance of it that um, we've had it suggested to us like you could just measure the, the people going into A&E uh, with either drug or, uh, as a result of drug or, 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 or alcohol abuse and you could then use that as a metric to see whether or not you're succeeding. I just find it odd that you, you wouldn't put one in for that and yet you've put metrics in for other things that the mayor has no control over. I mean, the mayor could at least, for example, has some control over, for example, uh, drugs through, uh, through MOPAC. Yes, and I mean, I'm looking at the number 14, the, um, the measure, the population measure. Uh, it's an interesting point. So we're often asked this, you know, why, do we, we're measure, why don't we just measure the, more, the, the sickness and death from tobacco rather than the population prevalence? The population prevalence of smoking is very important in terms of curtailing kids starting, which is what we're trying to get at, rather than the consequences downstream of what has happened to smokers. We could... Uh, you know, we would be very pleased to bring along other measures that we measure incidentally, which will enhance our understanding. Well, I'd, I'd appreciate doing. that. I'd appreciate that because one of the things that the, this committee will be looking at at some point in the future is the effect of high potency cannabis on the health of yes. young people. And it's, you know, other reports have indicated it's quite severe. Yes. Um, and it would be good if there was something in the health strategy that talk, talked about that, to talked about and some measurable, some aspiration as to how we're going to get rid of this blight. I mean, because as you know, high potency cannabis, if you're exposed to it under the age of 25, you're going to have lifetime effects on you. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, it, it's, it, it just, I found, I, I found the approach to drugs here a bit light touch. However, I do appreciate that there is a change. There was a change from, uh, in the wording, of the strategy that took out this idea of reducing the incidence or reducing the use of uh, mm. drugs and tobacco and instead, instead talked about the reduction of harm. Yeah. And I very much appreciate that because I think that's a very, very significant change in, in the mayor's approach. But I do think that there needs to be more about those more, more measures. But anyway, smoking uptake has already fallen across London. Um, what support are you going to be given in the strategy to encourage Londoners who already smoke to cut down or quit? What's going to be in there? What's, what's always in there? So there are programmes uh, which are funded through every local authority uh, which are about helping smokers to quit. And this has been a very interesting <coughs> period because we've seen the disruptive technology of um, vaping come into this. So we're seeing a reduction in prevalence every year now um, it is still an, an inequalities issue. But the reason for that may well be that people are simply doing this for themselves. So we're not taking full credit for that, but it's, it's still very important and we monitor very closely uh, the um, work that the local authorities are doing with the money they've got on smoking cessation. Whether it is the most effective and whether there are digital ways, and we're exploring that with Tar Hamlets, who is the lead borough on this, as to whether there are digital services and offers that actually are more attractive to people, particularly in the age group who now smoke, um, to help them to quit. Um, so, so we're looking at all the time how we can improve the effectiveness of the money we've got. Where I think we're somewhat weaker, but we want to improve, is on the advice that the um, clinicians can offer uh, to patients who are in a mindset that they may wish to give up. And that's the Making Every Contact Count program. Um, the nursing profession has been very helpful in putting out a program called All Our Health. It aims at midwives and health visitors uh, and practice nurses. And we are working also through uh, the work with the medical director and the NHS offer on inequalities about making every contact count for clinicians because they have powerful influence on their patients. 
And, and so I mentioned before that you know we will go back to the health and wellbeing boards to kind of ask them to take a note of our strategy as we do to the CCG groups. And the uh, figure which I, I saw was that 3% of all smokers who are told by, I find it hard to believe, mind you, who are, t who are smokers and are told by their GP to give up smoking, 3% will give up smoking. And so uh, the intervention of that simple advice has an enormous impact on their future. The many medicines I will give, the many treatments I will offer. And I think it's messages like that, that that we can give when we go out to our CCG communities. But, but people are bought into this approach. I think people recognise that you know, what we're looking at is how do we stop people smoking? And how, when they've started, how do we help them give up? And, you know, and again, there's no silver bullet, but there's a multiplicity of approaches. It's about restricting access to, to uh, cigarettes, it, restricting places you can smoke, and giving advice for those people who want to give up, how we help them. And, and I think you know, that's got to be the approach. But the lead agency on this is very much you know, the local public health teams that they're the ones who commission these services for each and every borough in London. I think the health that made me quit, it was the price. <laughs> I thought it was six pounds, I've been it's told it's higher. Higher, 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 so nine pounds. Yeah, yeah I, could, I can buy a small family car on what I used to spend on smoking. Anyway, um, the mayor's, will the mayor be calling on the government to protect the ring fencing on public health budgets? In, uh, 2019, which will be relifted in 2019. <coughs> um, well, others will be, uh, Mr. Bob, and uh, yeah, the mayor could, but uh, <laughs> we need to see if that um, influence comes to bear. Uh, I think it's recognised in government that these services could be vulnerable, and therefore um, uh, we are working very hard on it, making sure that there's a system in place where the public health system is funded to do what it needs to do. Okay. And what about? Um, do you think the mayor will call on local authorities and CCGs to stop disinvesting in drug, alcohol and sexual health support services? Because they are. Again, the mayor's voice would be, could be very helpful. I think it's important for us to use the mayor's voice where there, when we have done our jobs. And at the moment, we're working uh, with all of the local authorities to fully understand uh, every year and to encourage them to account financially every year for what they are spending the public health grant on. And that so far has gone very well, understanding that they have been, um, you know, they have been subject to very severe cuts. I think that is understood in the NHS as well, by the way, and supplementing, you know, help from the CCGs uh, and the transformation funding will be crucial if we're to really keep this whole show on the road. So, um, yes, if it were necessary, I think we would turn to the Mayor, but I think at the moment we're working hard to make the very best of what we have in the circumstances. And we do, uh, are aware that this is, this is sexual health is an important issue because what we know is the incidence of sexually transmitted infections in London is greater than the rest of the country and that there is an increase in this, not a reduction in this. And there are significant changes to how sexual health services are being run at the moment. And putting those three things together, you know, gives an opportunity where change in an arena where you're getting a higher demand can cause problems. So uh, we've been recently received a letter from uh, Dr. Sahota highlighting some of these issues, which we need really to kind of, you know, clarify, understand. But, you know, if we feel that, you know, Londoners, you know, are getting a poor deal from uh, sexual health services, you know, uh, you know I, I would expect Sadiq to um, fully understand the situation and, again, challenge the system to make sure the service is appropriate for the needs of Londoners. And is the Mayor fully in <coughs> favour of PrEP being available or free? Yes. I believe the Mayor yes. is. Yes, the yes. answer. Good. Yes. Well, I, 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 I was going to bring my attention to, to the letter I wrote to the mayor about these services, right? I got it in, didn't I? But you got it in quick, so thank you for it. Because I am, I mean, we are concerned that that, 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 that uh, um, investment in this area should, should be should be maintained, right? Okay, because there's some explanation we need to understand why the syphilis rates are going up in London, right? Why um, uh, patients, people have more difficulty getting access to services. Um, so I think funding may be one of the reasons. But anyway, I, I'm glad that the mayor's. 
Um, thank you, Chair. Um, the plan talks about social prescribing becoming a routine part of committee support across London. So firstly, not least for the benefit of people out there, what exactly do you mean by social prescribing? And you don't have a strategy as yet. Will you be having one? And if so, when will it be published? And finally, in terms of that particular, uh, in terms of the social prescribing side of things, what evidence is there that increased social prescribing will reduce health inequalities across London? So definition, strategy, and evidence about linkage, if any, between increased social prescribing and, and reducing health in inequalities. Social prescribing first started when GPs had the opportunity and they see patients who have got a, a, a need that they've brought to them but the solution to that need often requires a social intervention regarding addressing obesity with exercise, loneliness, uh, income issues with welfare benefits, housing So, uh, and the GP often did not have a place to, to get help for those patients. The a number of pilots looked about having a system whereby the GP can do a referral, just as I'd refer to a hospital dermatologist, I'd refer to a person who knew all the services in that local area. Because I know many of my local services, but not all of them. So can we have a person who can work with, that, with the patient to say, what is your need? What is the voluntary sector and, and a statutory sector around you that I can move you on to? So usually it involves three steps. The GP doing a prescription, the patient seeing or having a telephone contact with a navigator or advisor who knows the services and then being re um, referred on into the um, uh, voluntary sector. Um, yes, we are going to have a strategy and it's going to be developed uh, or it's going to be produced uh, in the, the winter autumn of this year. Um, the, there's been a number of studies of social prescribing. Um, and uh, the ones uh, I think are they're outside London. I think one's in Rotherham and one's mm. down in Fannet in uh, Kent, looking at the impacts of social prescribing. And so, and what they're trying to make sure is: is it looking at a population you know, are, it, it, which is deprived? And so, yes, it is. So, what we know is the patient, the recipients of this, tend to be mm. the, the population who's the most deprived, and its impact is impact on. Uh, on two things. One significant impact on the health service as well is that patients were often coming to their GP for that social contact or that medical contact but weren't getting the, the needs addressed and in fact for the health service there was less recurrent GP attendance after they attended a social prescriber and secondly also the impact albeit lower on hospital use was also lower. So what we know is that yes it is a, a system which is very well targeted and most deprived it has an impact both for the patient and also for the wider health system right. just move on so the plan also <laughs> sets out the target to reach the court's most vulnerable Lond londoners by 2028 um, so how will you identify the most vulnerable who are they and what level of increase in social prescribing would you deem a success um, so to, to wonder, I, I would hope really that every borough of, you know, has a social prescribing system in London. Uh, but the area you would kind of tend to, again, it's about how you target your work. If we're going to do things which are addressing health inequalities, we target our work. So we target at the areas where there's most deprivation. And uh, that, that, that is the approach we'll take. Um, when I speak to GPs, almost universally, I don't know if Dr. Hoto would agree, welcome the development of social prescribing because we all face daily patients in significant social distress where we don't have a solution for them and this gives a systematic sustainable solution which is welcomed by GPs, welcomed by patients and welcomed by the voluntary sector you know, or, you know, that, that, that they feel that sometimes their services aren't always used and this is a way for them to demonstrate how the service is used you know, effectively to develop it further, sorry, you know, it started as a GP prescriber, and just be, just as in many areas, you know, it was always a doctor who prescribed. But what it, this can be extended whereby the service can also be, you know, do you get nurse social social prescribing, and and hospitals have said themselves, why can't we, you know, uh, use this system as well? So I don't think it will settle as only a GP being the person delivering social prescribing for London.
So, I mean, some of the evidence is uh, looks at uh, it as a, a solution for um, inclusion health. And if, when you ask which groups, I mean, some of the most marginalised groups are groups that actually we've we've addressed in this strategy and we've met, and actually they want to continue to meet with us as representatives. Um, so you could you could think of the sort of people who are vulnerable to homelessness, who have chaotic lives, who were part of programs in the past, like the Troubled Families programs. These are the groups. Um, you could look at it by borough and say where the greatest inequalities in a borough are. That's where we really should locate our um, and, and taking the point about it gets down sometimes to street level, and a practice is a very good outlet for that. But we've also seen this as a response during emergency planning. We've seen groups like the British Red Cross move in and take almost take over the place of the statutory sector and how effective that can be in, you know, in, in the short term. The problem is it kind of disengages then unless there's a sustained way of funding it. So I think this strategy needs to address both who it's targeting um, and there's some good evidence in the literature about how to do that. We have the groups that we're in touch with, but also, you know, how do we sustain the funding for that so that you know we don't switch on and off? That would be not not a good solution for those groups. And, um, finally, there are plans to convene an inclusion health community forum in 2018-19. Can you give us more details of um, this proposed forum? And will this just be a one-off event, or would you have this have this on a regular basis? So. Um, Mr. Desai, I think this is probably what I was beginning to describe is the, um, the, the inclusion forum, the inclusion health forum. Um, there are many, I mean, the, the mayor and others meet various groups. Uh, there's a young person's forum, but I think the one we're describing here is that. And it won't be just a one off. Uh, I would anticipate this is an ongoing dialogue. We need to be informed better than we are, actually, about how dynamic the needs of these groups are, how they change. So it will continue, um, I think at the moment it, to some extent it's exploratory because it, it should be led by the people who want to engage and what they are telling us they need. But I think we need to document that and include it as part of our progress here. I was going to ask you that, who do you envisage sitting, you know, sitting in on this forum? Well, some of the health, the health team will be for sure. I'm sure the mayor will want to engage with this as well. And already we've had interaction with these, with this various of these groups, whether we have them all together or. Well, I've got a separately. list of six. Yeah. So it's the homeless people and rough sleepers, gypsies and travellers, care leaders looked after children, sex workers, uh, people with substance misuse disorders, and refugees and migrants, including the Roma community. They're the six groups I think that are presently yeah. Yeah, planned. Mm -hmm. um, just coming back to, to social prescribing, I, I, I think um, this is very important, but the, the issue is, of course, that um, sometimes members of the public can go directly to social prescribing or, or can do several referrals. Um, that what's available in any given area isn't very, does, everyone doesn't know what's available in that area. Is there a role for us to, for, for the GLA, to have a, a dashboard, right, also of the 32 boroughs where people can put their, their uh, personal address in or onto the system and come up, this is what's available in my area? or, or yeah, well, some sort. No, I think that's good. Day. Because so when, when um, social prescribing was you know, first started in London, um, uh, and, and, so the, and, and so Tower Hamlets, how they've done it is whereby I refer a person to a person who sits down, has a face to face contact, and they said, well, surely you know it, you, you'll get a much more productivity if it's done in, in a more digital way. So it's probably as well. Some people prefer the face to face. Others prefer, you know, just point me in the direction where I can go on a website and I can see the 72 voluntary sector organisations which help with loneliness. And sometimes the one-to-one -one does help for some people, often the elderly want that confidence of how to navigate the system. But for others, like you say, you know, a digital platform which allows you to access and, that. And, and this may also help the prescribers. Yeah. I mean, even the, the so doctors like and nurses. I can see it and you can see it as well. I agree. Yeah. yeah. So okay. if, if, some, if it's something can be done. Yeah, no, no, yeah, we'll take that. Great, thanks. Okay, um, Tony? Wait, 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 wait. What? I thought I'd finish. No, no, we, we, we never finish. Okay, <laughs> let, me, let me look at my crew. You can see that I'm an innocent of this connection. Yeah. Um, this is healthy a, places. Yes, this is, this is healthy places. Yes, the, the, the question related to um, uh, air quality. And 
I want to know, please, uh, you're saying uh, that uh, there's going to be a good work standard. Can we know when that's going to be published, please? This is in your Healthy Places document. Yes, yes. I'm looking for a... This you say the good work standard is yeah. cited as a major delivery mechanism for workplace health improvement. Um, when are you actually going to publish that? Okay, Sorry. no, no problem. Um, similarly, you are having um, a target of a thousand employers to measure whether the objective of encouraging smaller businesses and lower paid sectors. Uh, you're, you're using that uh, to show that your overall target is met. Uh, why have you just picked on a thousand uh, employers rather than doing some kind of random survey or, or, or some um, uh, method which will best reflect what's happening across London? Yes, this, so is, this, this relates to your milestone. Yes, yeah, it yeah, does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so currently we have 795 employers and I think they cover about 300,000. So covering you know, close on a million employees will be a big jump forward. I think your survey point is well made. Uh, we will want to be focusing on those businesses, particularly the small and medium enterprises, which are the majority in London, where um, some of the poorest work conditions and workers are. And there's two elements to that. There's the good work standard, uh, you know, and, and the health, the, the living, the London living wage, so that people have enough income. And there's what happens in the workplace for them, you know, how healthy is the workplace. Undoubtedly, the latter is will be more of a challenge. And I think, you know, working with a thousand, it would be great if we can do more. But I think if we can get a thousand to demonstrate what good work looks like, we will be doing very well on this. This will be a challenging target, I think. And, and it's doubling. So, so it's really doubling, what we're saying, yeah, yeah that um, uh, can we double the number of employees benefiting from the Healthy Workplace uh, Charter? Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, so it, uh, it, again, I think that's showing a lot of ambition to say, yeah, can we kind of in, you know, increase by that 100% uh, over this time? Uh, and a question, please, on targeting poor air quality. Does it follow that only areas, deprived areas, suffer from bad air quality? No. No, it doesn't. So, um, how will you decide which bits to target? Will you seek to find areas which have both poor air quality and deprivation to deal with that? I mean, how, how do you deal with it? Because um, someone who is not multiply um, uh, deprived might well be uh, prone to asthma. Even if he's a multi-millionaire, oh, yeah, I mean, Richmond. So, uh, yeah. so, so um, we'll, we'll probably answer this together. So, um, yeah, the, the the important point to make is all Londoners suffer from poor air quality. Yes, and uh, and I think to say we're going to just focus on improving the air quality in the most deprived borough, you know, would uh, not would uh, miss the point of you know how asthma doesn't choose who it you know, falls upon. You know, uh, and many other air quality related diseases are spread throughout Londoners. So this isn't <coughs> there way it's a target and only target those areas. There is a London wide plan to improve air quality. What we do know though is because of the, the areas of, of how um, houses are very close to roads and how uh, and the, the data shows that the schools in the poorest area have the poorest air quality. It just happens that the way it's laid at the moment is that the poorest people have the poorest air quality. And that there are adaptations you can make to schools and, and school journeys to address that. And so that's what we're doing. There'll be a pan-London, London-wide you know, air quality improvement plan with, within it an area which does some targeting, and that's the targeting in addition to the pan London work, which will address the health inequalities. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it would sound ludicrous if we tried to, to suggest that air stays in a place, you know, and doesn't disperse around. But there, there are concentrations of problems. I mean, Westminster has, and the City of London, that strip does have some very poor air quality, and some of it also is, uh, you, you, would un you would understand by knowing where the sources are along the shipping routes as well. Um, so we can measure that, and we do measure, as we have in here, the mortality from it, which isn't actually as great as the disability that it causes in terms of living. Um, so only about 5 or 6% of the overall deaths are attributable in any sense to air poor air quality, and they're generally part of other conditions, whereas a, an awful lot more people are suffering from exacerbations of asthma and um, are at risk of poor um, cardiovascular health because of air quality. So in a sense, and, and those people may already be carrying a risk from the factors we've been describing around smoking, early smoking, um, and uh, you know, lack of access to the health care system for early diagnosis. So there's quite an important inequalities dimension to it, but not necessarily in the way the air itself moves around them. It's, it's quite interesting you should, you should mention um, the, uh, the inability, if you like, to control the air. Do not think there ought to be a couple of paragraphs in the uh, strategy relating to the government's decision in relation to the third runway? Well, we will be, um, we definitely will be asked as a Public Health England to assess uh, the technical impact on health that the runway will have and the environmental will be involved with all of that are already. So we do have the factual information. I'm sure there will be a lot of statements about it and we will definitely want to make sure the mayor is well briefed. Yes. I think this is the first time the health committee has met since the decision was made. I think the chances are we all think it's going to have a bad effect on the health of Londoners. Um, but possibly that's um, not a medical opinion, that is a, an emotional opinion. Thank you, Chairman. Thanks. <laughs> um, um, I just want to pick up something else. Um, when you talk about partnership working with, with other partners, you've asked them to make voluntary pledges. But the mayor wants them to do something to push the health. Uh, health. Shouldn't you have expectation of your partners rather than just ask them to make voluntary pledges? Shouldn't you be saying to them, this is what we expect from you? Why do you choose to do ask voluntary pledges rather than expectations? Well, this comes back to the should bit. Yes, I was just going to say that that's exactly the opposite of what it says. Yeah. It, it does come back to the should bit in the. Uh, so the mayor is expecting, and we are too, expecting uh, more than just um, we, we, we think we might do this in 2028. We want to see some action this year and next year, and we're working very hard on that. The pledges are probably a different concept, which is we would like others beyond the statutory sector to come and join us and help. And in fact, we found some great willing there, and perhaps more willing than some of the statutory sector. So we do, we do the should for the statutory sector. I think the pledges are for all of London to offer. And we've had hundreds of pledges. Yeah, that's good. And the other, of course, thing is that this strategy should be a document which is known to all Londoners, which affects their health. They should be the most important partners in this strategy, is that the people of living in London should be aware of this, of our ambitions for them, and also that what their role is. How are we getting this strategy across to Londoners? How, what, what are we doing about making them the, the real important partners in the whole, in the whole strategy? So, so, so there, there will be a significant communications kind of a plan once you know this goes through yeah, it was being considered by the uh, the GLA at the plenary session, and uh, yeah, we will because because there is because much of what we're asking to do is asking sometimes for Londoners to kind of to take action themselves, be it on their own social prescribing, be it on uh, issues regarding childhood obesity, mental health, understanding thrive. There's so many things in here that we know will only work if Londoners understand and know what it's doing. You know, a social prescribing strategy which sits on the wall, not a single GP knowing about it won't work. So there will be a clear and quite comprehensive communication strategy. And that's probably one of the most significant bits which will start to happen uh, you know, once the uh, implementation plan and strategy is being accepted.
So, Chair, we, we're, we're not jumping the gun here. We are assuming that it will receive a good um, blessing from the Assembly. But with that assumption, um, if we're in the right place, we want to make a big deal out of this, actually. This is one of the biggest deals for London that I've seen in my career. Um, it's extremely important. It should be internationally recognised, and already it is. People have heard about this in development. I don't think other cities have done this. I don't think I know nowhere else around London. Uh, the, England has done this. And therefore, I think this should be something that London is very proud of. Uh, and, and that's the way I'm starting out. I think we need to make a big deal out of this. Now, on the 9th of October, uh, the, the next London Health Board is, being, is meeting in public. It's, a, it's a, a, a large event held here at City Hall where people are invited and a significant part of that agenda will be discussing you know, if the Assembly can kind of pass it through our health and equality strategy for London. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Doyle, and also Dr. Coffey, for coming. Uh, this brings the formal business to the end. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we are going to now, Mr. Harper. Uh, can I thank uh, both of you for your contributions? And finally, can I ask the committee to note the report and discussion with an invited guest and delegate authority to me as chair in consultation with the chair, chair with the chairman to agree any. I think with the, with the deputy chairman mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> to agree any output with discussions. Yes. Okay. And can we please agree recommendations? Agree the proposals of the Health Work Committee Work Program. Agree to use this next meeting, the 17th of July, to discuss London Ambulance Service, and delegate authority to the chair in consulting with the deputy chairman to agree the any side visits, informal meetings, or engagement activities before the committee's next formal meeting. Agreed. Okay. That closes the end. Thank you. GLA.